Good evening, everybody. Welcome back. Welcome to class number five <clears throat> of the Dispossessed class. Uh, I, we are now mm, this is the beginning of the second half of our discussion of the Dispossessed. Uh, I feel like there's still so much more to talk about. Um, I'm hoping that I won't have to add another class onto the end, but I might if things carry on this way, we'll sort of see how things go. But in any case, we'll, 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 that's uh, as, as it may be, and we'll, we'll keep moving forward. So um, uh, good, good evening to you, Karina, and to everybody else. Again, for those of you who are uh, uh, relatively new, if there are one or two uh, people here whose names I don't recognize right off. Um, do make sure you can add, if you, you type into the chat, you won't see what you typed right away because it's uh, set on so I can see it. Um, uh, but I can see all the things that you type as soon as you do. That's how you uh, uh, contribute and we <clears throat> uh, carry this on as we normally do. <laughs> okay, Cabe and Abraham is uh, starting a uh, a, 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 a one more class uh, chant here. So yeah, we'll see. And Noam is, is uh, skeptical that I'd even get through it if, with just one extra class, but we'll see. Noam, certainly I'm uh, very f going to be very far from uh, sort of sorting everything out uh, and, uh, uh, and, and kind of getting to the, getting to the bottom of everything. Um, in this class, actually, in some ways, even more than usual, I am, reminded of what is always my goal really in all of the Mythgard Academy classes. Of course, the goal is not that, you know, in the course of our discussions, as we go through the book, we come to the end of the last discussion and say to ourselves and each other, well, that was good. We basically figured that book out, right? We've, uh, good thing we've, we've uh, you know, sort of solved all the mysteries and explained all the things. Um, really, my goal is always a great deal more uh, uh, more mo modest than that, and that is just to to suggest some of the the questions and things that others of you can that you know you guys and 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 others can kind of sit down with and wrestle with a little bit more. It's just like Shevik, right? Shevik always said that his um you know he said that what he felt really set him apart as a physicist is the ability to ask the right questions, right? At the end of the day, that's what we're trying to do here uh, in um, in this uh, in this course, so I always uh, I always want to kind of push through and 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 talk about it more and 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 sort of think it through. But at the end of the day, if we can raise some really interesting issues for people to talk about more um, and think about more, then we've uh, we've done our work here. And I have really really enjoyed the uh, the presentations and and uh, and papers that I've heard at uh, Midmoot and Mythmoot and various other places um, that have come out of uh, these discussions um, and I've always uh, I've always been really really delighted by that so okay um, first quick announcements we are coming towards the end we are now in the penultimate week of the fundraising campaign which has been a, a wonderfully successful campaign so far we've raised over twenty five thousand dollars. Um, we are uh, uh, in total for the for the annual fund, which is great. The uh, the annual fund goal that is the goal for our entire fiscal year uh, for our, our our fundraising goal is fifty thousand dollars in order to make sure that all of our uh, programs run well throughout the year. We're so we're, we we we've already raised more than half of the money that we need for the entire year um, uh, already, and we still have a couple weeks left in our fundraising campaign. So that's um, uh, that's uh, uh, that's that's just awesome, and I've been been really uh, uh, glad uh, for that. Really grateful to everyone who has already given. Um, we have a couple more uh, big events, but of course, I want to I want to focus tonight on the big uh, event, the annual um, end of campaign webathon, which has been traditional, uh, which is going to be a lot of fun. And I always look forward to the webathon every year. And we've got a great webathon planned this year. Uh, the first thing that I should point out for those of you who have been following the campaign events carefully on the website. We've actually had a date change. I was originally projecting to do the webathon on Sunday the 30th. We're shifting it to Saturday the 29th because that will enable me 
to make it longer because we had so much awesome stuff that I couldn't squeeze it all into the Sunday afternoon that I wanted to do it. And so now we're, uh, we're, we're, we're pushing back to Saturday the 29th. We're going to start at 11 a.m. Eastern time, uh, and we're going to go until probably 9 or 10 o'clock p.m. Uh, that day. So we're, we're looking at 10 to 11 hours uh, worth of broadcast on that day. Uh, lots of different things that we're going to be doing. Um, we're going to be doing, uh, uh, but, and, but of course, the, the, the number one thing that I want to emphasize, um, okay, two, two things I want to emphasize. Uh, first, we're going to be doing another special Mythgard Academy one-shot class. Remember, we did the class on Isaac Asimov's Nightfall uh, back a couple weeks ago, which was really fun. And we're now taking the other nomination, and I mentioned this before, and we're going to do our one-shot discussion of Stranger Things, uh, the new series that was put out by Netflix just a, just a couple months ago. Um, so I have now finished watching Stranger Things. Um, and uh, Karita, I think that you asked me a question last time, which I didn't answer, uh, which was who is my favorite character in Stranger Things? Dustin, hands down. The, uh, the toothless kid, he is absolutely my favorite character in that entire show. Um, uh, uh, the the scene I love the scene when he was like, "Do you remember what happened when we split the party? When the right and the trolls picked them off one by one? Ah, uh, that was great. That was that was that was awesome. Anyway, um, so yeah, yeah, Dustin, Dustin is definitely my favorite. Anyway, um, so I'm I'm really looking forward to talking about Stranger Things. I'm going to be joined by a special guest, Brenton Dickinson, who is uh, a wonderful uh, 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 teacher and blogger, and he's on our faculty at Signum. Uh, also a big fan of the show, and he and I are gonna are gonna have a discussion together. It's not gonna be like the normal Mythgard Academy class because as you guys know, that is way too much content for me to attempt to get through in one session, right? I mean, how how insane uh, does uh, um, does that uh, does does that sound, right? That I would be able to do eight episodes of a TV show in one single session, even a, you know one single two hour session. Um, so it's not gonna be the 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 normal kind of um, the the normal kind of thing. Um, but, uh, but so we're going to have more of a kind of a free ranging discussion over the sort of the themes and ideas of the, of the, the show as a whole. I hope that you guys will be able to attend that is scheduled by the way, for 6 PM to 8 PM. Uh, is that right? No, that's totally not correct. 4 PM to 6 PM, uh, on Saturday, the 29th, 4 to 6 PM Eastern time, uh, on the 29th is when we're scheduled to do the, uh, the, the, the stranger things discussion. Um, links and things are going to be posted. There'll be a whole chart and everything on the website that'll be going up uh, very soon. I just wanted to let you know um, that uh, that that's going to be happening. So, okay, cool. So, uh, and uh, and there's going to be. Oh, I, I said there were other things other than the Stranger Things thing. Going to that I wanted to tell you guys about um, earlier in the day, and I'm, I think I'm going to do this kind of throughout the day. Um, I'm going to do um, I'm going to do a trivia contest. Um, and I've done before, I've done like Tolkien trivia before, which is cool. And there will be a certain amount of Tolkien involved, of course, uh, in the trivia contest. But I want to <clears throat> I want to do a, a trivia contest, which really draws on, on a bunch of the different works that we've done. So those of you who have been faithfully attending Mythgard Academy classes uh, and have uh, uh, a, uh, memories with any degree of retentiveness um, will be able to uh, respond to questions to various of the the works that we've talked about in the last three years of the Mythgard Academy. Those, those will all be in play uh, for trivia questions. And I'm going to do, um, we're going to have like uh, trivia competitions for like individual segments. So I'll be doing like a, 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 a trivia segment here, a trivia segment here. Um, and, but we'll also do a, a throughout the day a cumulative trivia award. Um, so it's going to be fun. There's going to be a lot of uh, of fun giveaways and auctions and things like that. It's the uh, it's again it's the end of our fundraising campaign. We like to uh, to to sort of send things out with a bang with the webathon. So I, I certainly hope that you're uh, 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 that you're will be able to join us for at least part of the day uh, on the 29th. Recordings uh, of I think all the sessions will be available uh, after the fact. Um, but of course, you know, obviously, like the trivia competition is uh, is not going to be. Uh, uh, obviously live uh, during the later during the later sessions. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, Noam is uh, is is complaining about the, the the sudden and unexpected requirement 
uh, of uh, retaining memories from previous classes. I know. Well, see, Noam, that's why I wanted to spring that on you now, right? So that I wouldn't be springing it on you uh, next Saturday. Um, so uh, yes, and Julie, there will be. I am going to be sharing a schedule uh, for that. It, it, it will be on the on the the Signum University campaign website, and that should go up just within the next uh, the next day or two. So. Um, all right. Yeah. Well, don't think of it as a, as a, a surprise exam, Yana. It's it's fun. It's a game. There are going to be prizes. It's going to be great. Um, so, uh, yeah. <clears throat> Kay, I don't think you have to re-listen to the entire three years worth of Mythgard Academy classes, as that might be challenging even if you did it continuously for the next week between now and, and, uh, and, and when it's going to happen. But, you know, kind of reminding yourself, skimming through the books a little bit, right, you know? might uh, might end up coming in uh, uh, coming in handy. Um, and Tom, no, I wouldn't think that 42 will be an answer because that book never got elected. It's been so close, right? Um, uh, Hitchhiker's Guide has been definitely in the always a bridesmaid category for a while. I think uh, uh, Douglas Adams and uh, and uh, um, and Neil Gaiman have are both pretty close to the top now with uh, Authors whose works have almost been elected numerous times uh, in the Mythgard Academy, but they've never gotten over the top yet. Um, all right, all right. Okay, all right. Um, good. So that's why I wanted to say, uh, be on the lookout for the for the schedule there and the registration links and all that kind of thing. It's gonna be, it's gonna be fun. All right. Um, so, oh, uh, Neil Ottenstein asked a, a great question earlier on. Um, uh, any words about Baron and Luthien? Yeah, I did see the news, Neil. Um, for those of you who haven't heard, uh, HarperCollins just uh, did a press release that they're going to they're going to be producing, um, and it's not until next year, right? 2017, Neil, is when that's expected to hit the press. A new edition of the story of Baron and Luthien, um, a sort of Children of Hurin esque. Um, uh, treatment uh, of uh, of the story of Baron and Luthien, which promises to have new material. Um, I can believe that. I mean, so this is sort of an aside for those of you who uh, did The Lost Road with me recently. Um, you'll remember in Christopher Tolkien's discussion of The Lost Road um, that he did a lot of kind of summary here and there, not just summary, but kind of patching stuff together, right? So he kind of started with the published Silmarillion text of Baron and Luthien as a base, and then instead of giving us a continuous narrative for the state of the different manuscripts, he described the complicated manuscript relationship of the Baron and Luthien story at the time of of, uh, of the Quintus Silmar of the 1937 Quintus Silmarillion, and then he kind of gave extracts right on the principle of here are things that are different from the published Silmarillion. But that kind of left it to us, right, to sort of patch that stuff all together, which is a very similar approach to the one that he took in Unfinished Tales to the child to the to the Children of Turin. The uh, the Turin Turambar story, which got published in Unfinished Tales, was the biggest version, you know, the the fullest version of the Turin story that Tolkien wrote. But it's not there in full text. Um, there are several sections, of course, one huge chunk of the story um, around from like Margathrond through. Um, uh, through the to the to the to the woodman, if I'm remembering correctly. But anyway, um, when Christopher Tolkien just kind of says, <clears throat> and the text from here to you know for a while, it's exactly the same as the published Silmarillion. Go look it up there, right? And then we'll rejoin the story when it gets different again, right? Later on, so that the longest, fullest version of it wasn't a complete text. So that when the Children of Hurin was published, uh, now ten years ago, 2007, as I recall. Um, when the Children of Huron was published in 2007, it was basically the first full-length, like, you know, sort of novel-length treatment of the story of Tour and Turambar, which was essentially the unfinished tales text with the other bits added in, and you know, some other, um, some other editorial alterations that Christopher had made, sort of, you know, with extra time to work on it and think through it and different conclusions that he had drawn. But there wasn't really any totally new material, or not much totally new material. Um, I have to say, from the description I read of it, Neil, I'm not expecting to be blown away by brand new material nobody's ever read before. Um, it sounds like it's just going to be gathered together, you know, sort of going to be a, a much more user-friendly 
sort of treatment of the whole story of Baron and Luthien. I'm not expecting vast quantities of never before read by us material. Uh, that is never before read by people who have read the history of Middle Earth material uh, on Baron and Luthien. But uh, but yeah, so that's that that is Yana. That's exactly my guess. That kind of compilation, um, compiled unified narrative. I uh, like the children of Hurin is basically is basically what I'm expecting, but that's cool, right? Um, I think that, uh, you know, and and it's supposed to be gorgeously illustrated by Alan Lee again, like Children of Hurin was. I mean, I, it, the Children of Hurin is just a gorgeous volume with the illustrations and everything. It's it's really great. Um, so so yeah, I mean that alone, like you know, the, a a a fuller expanded, uh, more user friendly version with Alan Lee illustrations is total. I mean, I'd pay for that. By itself, uh, even if it doesn't contain any, um, you know, startling revelations. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah. Um, Yana says it will include the Lay of Lathian too. Yeah, I, I, I do. I. We'll see. I mean, I'm not sure. I mean, I. To what extent is he going to unify it? I don't know. I mean, I don't think Yana. I'll be surprised if the volume that they publish is, is very history of Middle Earth ish. Um, I don't expect it to be very history of Middle Earthish because we we have that already, and I think the the whole point, as I understand it, of releasing it again, like with the Children of Hurin, is to be able to give it a sort of a one you know a a, a one stop shop for the story. Now the story of Baron and Luthi and the different versions can't really be drawn together in the same way. I think. Um, I mean, certainly you can't have like. Here's what we're gonna combine the poetry versions and the, the poetic version and the prose version and just kind of put them all together. That's not that's not gonna work out, right? So, um, you know, uh, 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 clearly they're gonna be they're gonna be multiple uh, versions of it. But I'd be very surprised if it's a, a sort of a fully edited, you know, with notes and commentary kind of thing like we got in the history of Middle Earth, giving all you know all of the different manuscripts in full. I don't think because that would just be a scholarly text, and he's given us a scholarly text in in the in the history of Middle Earth series. Um, you don't ask Alan Lee to do a series of gorgeous illustrations for another and fuller scholarly text of Baron and Luthi, and I, I just I, that's clearly not what it's going to be. So um, clearly targeting at user friendliness. So we'll see. Um, Yana asks if he's the only one who's impressed that Christopher is still at it uh, at his age. Um, yeah, I, Yana, I mean, what Christopher has accomplished, I mean, what Christopher has accomplished in his life, you know, from from the early days when he was first putting together the published Silmarillion, you know, in the, in the mid-70s, all the way through now, I mean, the 40 years of scholarly productivity that Christopher Tolkien has has had um, on you know the, the all the wonderful work that he has done on his on his father's uh, papers, it's it's a staggering uh, sort of lifetime accomplishment of scholarship that Christopher Tolkien has had, and of course so much of it unsung while his father was still alive, right? When he was working much more just behind the scenes, helping his dad um, to to you know put things together and 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 sort things out and pull things together. It's been uh, it's been it's been remarkable. It's really been remarkable. So uh, yeah, I, Yana, I, I'm I am uh, I'm not saying I'm surprised he's still at it exactly, uh, but but I am certainly deeply impressed and and deeply grateful for all that he's uh, for all that he's done. So anyway, all right. Um, but yeah, thanks Neil for mentioning that. Um, it is uh, it is a, an interesting prospect. We'll see. You know, I, whether or not like we do a Mythgard Academy class on that book or not. Um, you know, I don't really know. I'm, again, I'm not really sure if there's going to be enough uh, sort of new material for us to to kind of do, since we will have done a lot of the material. I think I think we already have done most of the material that's going to be in it. Um, but uh, but we'll see. Okay, let's talk about the dispossessed, or I'm going to be end up adding four classes. So where were we last time? We got to talk there in the moonlight, right? And I couldn't even bear to go on, apart from the fact that we were over time already. Um, so we were looking at Shevik's isolation and, uh, uh, we're just looking at some, some extremely powerful passages, um, looking at the way in which Shevik is a nuknib, right? How he's kind of quarantined, how he just seems to sort of fit in 
you know, he 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 feels like a shadow water in Urus, but yet we were also looking at ways in which he was already a fish out of water on Anaris. We were looking at the parallels between him and Odo, right? And how he has gone one step further than the rest of his society, which is the step back to Urus, right? Um, and uh, uh, and then in, in the end, we were looking at his partnership with Takver and what that was kind of revealing about his own understanding of himself and of his role. So tonight we're gonna shift back outwards in looking at sort of larger societal issues again. Um, but really, I hope that uh, everybody will see. Um, I hope that everybody will see that we are um, basically still talking about a very similar thing. But what we're gonna be doing here tonight is essentially switching around to the other side of the wall, almost. Right, not exactly because we're still going to be looking at Shevik, but just as in that very first opening image of the book, you've got the wall, which from one way of looking at it encloses the spaceport, and on the other way of look, looking at it encloses the entire planet away from the rest of of of, of the universe. Right, um, uh, same wall, different ways of 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 looking uh, uh, of looking at it, um, but. Um, uh, anyway, so uh, similarly, we were looking at Shevik and his isolation from society. Now I want to look at that society and what is it about it that is sort of making Shevik isolated, um, so if you see what I mean by that parallel there. Um, so let's let's look. This is when he's he's on on uh, uh, on Urus and he's thinking about his relationship with uh, uh, with Urus and explaining why he's there. Uh, and this is back fairly early on. This is chapter five, I think, um, the one where he's talking with Chifoyalisk. Um, And he says that he came to bargain like a proprietarian, right? Bargain what? For what? Chifoyalisk wants to know. Remember, Chifoyalisk is essentially a Thuvian spy, right? Just as Pei or Pai, I'm not sure how to pronounce his name. They pronounce his name Pai because it's more fun. P-A-E, right? Um, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll call him Pai. Um, Pi is clearly an agent, right, of the, uh, uh, the, 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 the Iotic government, right, the Iotic government. Um, but anyway, okay, so, uh, so he's talking to Chifoyalisk, and Chifoyalisk is basically asking, like, okay, so you've, you've made a bargain, right? What have you promised to give them, and what have they offered you in return? But of course, notice Chifoyalisk does not understand the undercurrent of Shevik's claim to a, to be here to bargain, right? That is, he doesn't understand not only how alien the concept of bargaining is to Shevik, but the kind of disdain that that entire concept conveys in Shevik's mouth, right? When Shevik is talking about that, there is a certain amount, not only of insult to the culture, but of uh, of of self criticism, right? Even a, a, something almost like self loathing. Um, when he's describing this himself. Anyway, okay. Shevik's face had taken on the cold, grave look it had worn when he left the fort in Drio. You know what I want, Jafoylisk. I want my people to come out of exile. I came here because I don't think you want that in Thu. You were afraid of us there. You fear we might bring back the revolution, the old one, the real one, the revolution for justice, which you began and then stopped halfway. Here in Aeo, they fear me less because they have forgotten the revolution. They don't believe in it anymore. They think if people can possess enough things, they will be content to live in prison. But I will not believe that. I want the walls down. I want solidarity, human solidarity. I want free exchange between Urus and Anaris. I worked for it as I could on Anaris. Now I work for it as I can on Urus. There I acted. Here I bargained. With what? Oh, you know, Jafoilus, Shevik said in a low voice with diffidence. You know what it is they want from me. Okay. Um, yeah, Nancy makes a really interesting observation that he's not afraid to insult Thu to Jafoilus's face. Nancy, of course, we see he's not afraid to speak out at almost any time, right? Sometimes he is discreet, like sometimes he seems to not consider it worthwhile, or sometimes he, he but he, he rarely seems, Shevik rarely seems to lack the courage to speak his mind, right? And we'll look at some other examples of that uh, later on in today's class, but, um, but yeah, yeah. Um, 
more, what else do you notice? What else do you notice in this passage? When he's talking about bargaining, when he's talking about what he wants, right? Um, he says that he thinks the people in Thu don't want revolution. They don't want this kind of change, right? He, his goal is solidarity, human solidarity, meaning solidarity between Anaris and Urus. That's his goal, right? There I acted, here I bargain. Um, now you'll remember right after this, uh, uh, when Shevik says, you know what it is they want from me, Shefoyosk responds by saying, I didn't realize that you knew what they wanted from you, right? He thought that Shevik was simply, was completely naive, right? Um, that, uh, that Shevik hadn't even really figured out the fact that they're manipulating him, that they're using him, that they've brought him here, not because they're just wanting to honor him as a physicist, but because they're trying to get from him the general temporal theory for, to use for their own advantage, right? Um, Shevik here reveals that he does know what the propertarians are trying to get from him, what they have to gain. From the situation. Um, so, okay. And he's come to bargain, right? So he is now revealing that he's much more cunning than he has seemed, and that he's he knows he's being manipulated by them, but he's manipulating them back. Is that the situation? Is that what we're supposed to get from this? My question, and my question is really vague, for which I apologize. Where is Shevik in this? What do we see about, see, where is he? It's such a big question. Um, but I hope perhaps you begin to see what I'm trying to get at. Again, last time we were talking about his isolation, his perception of his, um, both his situation in relationship to the two societies and his perception of his relationship to the two different societies and with other people in general. My question is sort of similar. What is he showing about himself, about his relationship with those societies and about his perception of that relationship with those societies? What of that do we see, do we see here? James points out he's in a position of power now. Yes, James, we see him deliberately invoking a position of power, right? Deliberately establishing himself in a position of power. That's what it means to bargain, right? Bargaining is intrinsically proprietarian. Not just because you have to own something in order to be able to bargain, right? If you're bargaining what for what, right? As Chifo I mean, the, the premise of Chifoilisk's question at the beginning, what for what means both people involved have to claim ownership of something, right? You've got, you, you have that, I have this, let's negotiate how we can exchange it, right? It shows both that there is private property on both sides and also that there's uh, um, that there is the idea of the, that kind of transfer of ownership. Like I, we have power over this thing and can can uh, you know sort of manipulate it in relationship with each other, right? That's so. So yes, uh, James, he's deliberately adopting that posture um, and sort of claiming that kind of power, right? Um, what else? Now Sarah Lagarde is noticing that. Uh, Shevik is here thinking about humans, right? Human solidarity, the, the emphasis that he makes on human solidarity in which he is being deliberately inclusive, right? Um, and Sarah Lagarde is remembering that it's like Atro, right? Who calls them Setians using that term from the, um, from the Birdseed Papers, right? The, the, the idea that this one, this one category, which includes both, both Urus and Inaris, um, Though, of course, Sarah, it's interesting that he doesn't use the word setian, right? He just uses human, which I think is important, right? He's not talking about the planets. He's not talking about the worlds and talking about the two worlds coming together. He's talking about the, the people, right? In other words, what he's clearly doing is recognizing, which the name setian kind of does, but less directly, right? By creating this this third category, this category which is in fact unfamiliar to some people. If you say, hey, we're all Setians, not everybody is totally down with that vocabulary on Urus, right? And clearly nobody on Anaris has even heard of it. Um, 
the, the that that common bond, that common link that they all have is 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 being human, right? That's what that's what you know. The, this you know the the nature that they all share as humans is something that the, that Shevik is appealing to here. Yeah. Um, good. Yeah. No, Sarah, excellent, uh, excellent point. Um, Sarah Lagarde adds a point about the the structure of the book here. Um, at this point in chapter five, um, we have no idea what he did on Anaris, right? He says on Anaris, right? I worked for it as I could on Anaris. There I acted. And Sarah's very right to point out what does that mean, right? We don't know. We've not seen that yet. We've not got anywhere close to that in our NRST narrative, right? Um, through the even numbered chapters in this book so far. Um, so, yeah, Sarah, it's a really interesting anticipation of that, right? This sort of what from this perspective is a foretelling of the future or actually it's a description of the past which is also a foretelling of the future um and i certainly hope by this point in the book none of us can avoid the way in which the structure of the book invokes this question of sequency and simultaneity right um essentially i feel like what i am trying to do in trying to pull all the different pieces and themes of this book together is come up with a general temporal theory of the dispossessed right uh, but uh, anyway, um, but anyway, so S Sarah Lagarde, you're you're completely right to say that um, we don't yet know how he was working, and it it does definitely invite us to to wonder how did he act exactly, and what uh, what what went on there. Um, Carita asks the excellent question: Do the people for whom he is going to so much trouble want solidarity? Well, Karita, it kind of seems not. <laughs> right? I mean, that is to say, this is why I started off looking at um, at Shevik's isolation, right? Um, because this sounds like a lovely ideal, right? Um, like you, you're going to meet resistance, right? But but he's he's doing the brave thing, uh, working towards this goal, which. You know, is to the benefit of the, the the benefit of humanity, and he, humanity wants. There might be some close-minded people. There might be some power mongers who are resistant and who are who are invested in entrenched systems and whatever. But human solidarity, this is obviously something everybody can get behind, right? Except Carita, uh, no. Is there any evidence of that, <laughs> right? Um, um, whom does he represent? Remember when that question came up? As always in this book, every conversation. That is had in this book will come out come up relevant again in a whole new way. This whole new layer of meaning will be added as we look back on it from later on in the book. So just so you remember the 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 conversation that first conversation we had between him and the physicists, the first full one, um, in uh, chapter what was it chapter three, um, where he was uh, they were asking him if he you know like who sent him right. Um, like, you know, did your government send you? Do, and the question was, like, they were shocked to find out that he didn't represent anybody, right? That he was not sent to Urus at all. That he doesn't have any authority to say what he's saying or to do what he's doing. Um, and they're kind of left wondering, does he represent anybody, right? And, Karita, the kind of cool thing is that we're still wondering if he represents anybody. It's just that that question is now an even bigger question than it was a far more all-encompassing question than it was when it was raised back in that much more narrow circumstance back in that first conversation. Um, good, good. Um, yeah, Noam says, it seems that Shevik has an idea of the difference between ends and means, which we don't see so much in the rest of the story. Yeah, yeah, Noam, you're right. In this passage, we see him talking and thinking about ends and means in ways which are strikingly different. Um, you know, Noam, I hope to get to the passage. Here's sort of betraying my ambition for tonight's class. I hope to get to the passage where he and uh, Takver are talking about the publication of his book, The Principles of Simultaneity, um, his, his, his big book that Sabo initially blocks and then, um, uh, and then um, appropriates in the 
you know, standard Sabulian fashion, right? Um, Sabulish, Sabuluvian, trying to think of the good, the correct adjectival form of Sabul. But anyway, um, in Sabul's inimitable style, uh, uh, Sabulbian, Tom, uh, we have a winner. Sabulbian, yeah. Uh, in the Sabulbian style, um, perfect, perfect. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, I, I think. Well, see, yeah, see, Kay, I was thinking of bullishness, too, with sabullish. I kind of like that, too. But the problem is that bullish, in actual, like, the actual connotations, the actual usage of bullish actually is different. It's contrary, really, to what sabullish would be. So I think I kind of like sabulbian uh, better. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's, I think it's perfect. Anyway, okay, sorry. So, um... As I hope to get to that passage where he's thinking very much about means and ends, right? Um, but this, of course, is earlier. Um, uh, uh, no, except it's except it's later, right? But we do see him having um, a really keen notion of means and ends here, which I think is certainly really important. Um, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> Rachel. Uh, Draper says, Odo seemed to want human solidarity, but is it even possible when you cut yourself off from most of human society, which is what Anaris has done? They are afraid of contamination. Exactly, Rachel. Well, that's part of the big question, right? Um, and again, that seems to me one of the primary, uh, one of the primary effects of the parallelism between Odo and, she and Shevik, right? Because um, remember, remember the insight that he has when he's there um, you know, seeing the statue of Odo, right? And what he realizes is Odo is not Anaresti. She never was in Anaris, right? <clears throat> yes, Anaris has been founded on Odonian principles. And so you can say that Anaris is the triumph of Odonianism. Um, but Rachel, the question, right? The sort of sobering question is, is it the triumph of Odonianism or is it the failure of Odonianism? In a sense, that was one of the things that was at stake in that very first debate we had at the end of chapter two between teenage Shevik and Tiran, right? When Tiran was saying, if our society is like supposed to be the best and most enlightened, shouldn't we be sharing it, right? Shouldn't we be reaching out and helping the Arasti? And everyone's like, no, 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 right? But I, that's a good question, right? And remember some of the things that we've looked at that Shevik has been thinking about being an exile, right? And about how um, explorers stay connected, right, with the society that sent them out. If you don't, you're just you're just an exile. You've just wandered away. And again, that could be construed in a sense of uh, of as a, in the sense of, of being a failure of Odonianism, right? Um, that failure seems to be one of the potential implications of that note that he finds in the pocket of his coat, right? Now, I will also betray the fact that I have no ambitions to get to that. <laughs> I want to talk about the note in his coat, um, but I know my well enough to know there's a 0% chance I'm going to get all the way there. So, but we'll talk about that next time. Um, uh, anyway, okay. Um, yeah, Yana is saying throughout the book, I'm starting to think that uh, that Anaris might not actually reflect Odo's teaching that well. Um, yep, yeah, we're going to be we're going to be we're going to be seeing that uh, as we as we as we go through. Brian very aptly reminds us. Brian Dimick says that Shevik uh, Shevik says that the settlers were romantics, but uh, the Anaresti are now pragmatic. Um, yes, yes, that's in his conversa uh, his conversation with Vea. Um, yes, yes. And again, so even there, again, I think you can, you can see that he is sort of has become a good deal more jaded, certainly than when he was a teenager, about his assessment of the NRST culture. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, let's keep going. Um, this is uh, this is Atro, 
of course. So sorry, I was just trying to remember this passage. This is Atro. Uh, this is you know Atro. You'll remember is the uh, the old physicist, the one that he was been he's been corresponding with the longest, uh, the one that he is sort of his first convert, right? He convinced Atro about the importance of simultaneity, and Atro has been sort of the champion of the the I don't know what's the adjective form of Shevik Shevikian, the Shevian principles, right? Um, in in uh, you know the Ionic circles. Um, anyway, so here's here's uh, here's here's Atro. I hope you feel the same, my dear. I earnestly hope it. There's a great deal that's admirable, I'm sure, in your society, but it doesn't teach you to discriminate, which is, after all, the best thing civilization teaches. I don't want those damned aliens getting at you through your notions about brotherhood and mutualism and all that. They'll spout you whole rivers of common humanity and leagues of all the worlds and so on, and I'd hate to see you swallow it. The law of existence is struggle, competition, elimination of the weak, a ruthless war for survival, and I want to see the best survive. The kind of humanity I know, the Setians, you and I, Urus and Inaris. We're ahead of them now, all those Hainish and Terrans and whatever else they call themselves, and we've got to stay ahead of them. They brought us the interstellar drive, but we're making better interstellar ships now than they are. When you come to release your theory, I earnestly hope you'll think of your duty to your own people your own kind, of what loyalty means, and to whom it's due. The easy tears of old age had sprung into Atro's half-blind eyes. Shevik put his hand on the old man's arm, reassuring, but he said nothing. Okay, this is, of course, in the context of that conversation where uh, Atro is introducing that distinction about SETI and physics, right, um, that, we, that we talked about before. Yeah, Nancy says this really exposes how violent this concept of loyalty can be. Exactly. Human solidarity sounds great, right? But does it mean this, right? Um, when Shevik is uh, thinking about human loyalty, has he just not thought this far? What about the other races, right? What about the other planets? What about other system. What about the, the Hainish and the Terrans, right? Um, uh, yeah, so, okay. <laughs> Yana and then James Stevens ask consecutive questions, first about the Terrans and then about the Hainish. Uh, and basically both questions are about, wait a second, to what extent are they connected? So, so they have just discussed, that is, Shevik and, and Atro have just been discussing, or at least alluding to, the um, debate about human origins, right? Um, uh, the Hainish claim that the Hainish are the original race and that all other all of the other races, the, the, the Setian races and the Terrans, are all um, descendants of the Hainish, right? They're sort of, uh, you know, uh, spin-offs of Hainish culture. Um, Atro denies it, right? He just doesn't believe it at all. He believes that the Setians are different, and he considers the Hainish and the Terrans aliens, right? Um, so what we have here, of course, is Atro on the one hand being a lot less us versus them than most of the other people in his society, right? Less in the sense that he embraces an Anaris, right? He doesn't get all us versus them with the people in the moon, right? It would seem, this isn't stated explicitly, but it would seem that his relationship with Shevik has helped in that way, right? He's been working with Shevik for so long. Um, he has come to respect, you know, an a, a NRST phys physics, chiefly through Shevik, that he's willing to embrace the NRST as brothers, in a sense, right? At least to, to sort of include them within... But but he still has a very strong us versus them. He's just he's not actually changed his us versus them mentality. He's just shifted the definitions of who who is us and who is them, right? Um, so so yes, according to Atro, those lines are those lines are pretty clear, right? And they exclude the Hanish and the Terrans. Now it still seems to be a bit of an open question. Um, Shevik seems much more open to the Hanish idea, right? to the possibility of solidarity with these other races. But we saw that that wasn't really his focus, 
Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, Tom says, in any human society, a distinction always arises between us and them. That's human nature and works against any real spontaneous and voluntary solidarity. One on one is one thing, but the more people, the more distinctions. Human nature. Yeah, this is just, just it's it's normal. It's how people work. Right. Um, and we see it from both sides. We see it towards the NRST by the Eurosti. We see it towards the Eurosti by the NRST, right? That's one of the things we get by going back and forth in the way that we do um, in the different frames, in the different, uh, in the different chapters. Um, yes, so we get that. But of course, uh, you know, Tom, thinking about the terms that you were just using, um, that human nature's establishment of these distinctions always distinguishing between us and them this 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 what seems to be a very broad human tendency to do that um notice what atro says about that right atro says it's the best thing that civilization teaches it's civilization civilization that teaches us to discriminate right and he means discrimination. We use the word discrimination now. The word discrimination has has achieved an entirely negative connotation in our culture, I think, much more so even than at the time this book was written. Um, but of course, the word discriminate doesn't intrinsically have an intrinsically uh, um, negative definition, right? It just means to be able to tell the difference between two different things. Right. If you if you have a finely discriminating palate, it means you can you can distinguish between different tastes very you know to it to it to a very fine degree. Right. Um, so you know, having discriminating senses. Right. And again, it means you can you're good at telling the difference between things that are that are not quite the same. Um, it is in that sense that civilization, according to Atro, teaches us teaches humans discrimination right and the discrimination that he's talking about what we are to be discriminating between is us and those damned aliens in his words right that's where he draws the line um so it's interesting to me tom that atro attributes that discrimination that 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 distinction um between us and them to civilization um Which is kind of interesting. Does that mean that he then denies that it's natural? That is, that he denies that it's that it's intrinsic, um, that it's something learned from culture, from civilization. That is, rather than something innate, right? Um, I think he might be suggesting that. But um, the law of existence is struggle, competition, elimination of the weak, a ruthless war. For survival just hang on to that that'll come up relevant later on um, remember atro's definition of the law of existence um, yeah um, yeah yeah um, one thing I think that we can yeah, good. Sorry, James, let me jump right to what you're saying here. I'm going to say something else first, but let me not do that. Um, James Stevens points out, HRO is now bargaining. Anaris and Urus together for the price of keeping the theory for the Setians. James, you are absolutely right. The subtext of HRO's speech that he's making to Shevik here is bargaining, right? He is asking him, when you come to release your theory, I earnestly hope that you'll think of your duty to your own people, right? Um, and the, it is almost, James, there, there, there is an implicit offer, right? Um, in as much as Atro represents the Erosti standpoint, if you will stand together with us, we'll stand together with you. Yeah, um, the Setians, you and I, Urus and Anaris. James, that is sort of said almost as if it's like an offer, right? But in exchange, help to 
essentially increase the gap between us and them, with them being defined as as uh, those damned aliens. Um, yeah, maybe. Noam says he thinks that HO implies that civilization um, uh, makes us better at identifying the discrimination you should make. Maybe. Maybe. I think I can accept that. Um, yeah, 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 good. Tom Hillman points out the kind of humanity I know is what he defines as the best. Yes, yes, he does. Good, good. Um, yeah. But this question of human nature, obviously that was in my mind as it's what I've titled the class. Um, I, I, I initially pulled that phrase, um, in case you don't remember. Um, that phrase was used back in the, again, that first discussion among the physicists in chapter three, in the passage where they were talking about Sabal and Sabal's, um, uh, uh, Sabal's, basically what they were reading between the lines. And, and when we talked about that, how at the time it sounds like, oh, they must be wrong, right? They don't, they don't understand it because they're not processing it because they're, they're erosity and they don't understand how things really work on Anaris. But then of course, in the very next chapter, we go back to go back to Anaris and back in time and discover that in fact, they read through the lines exactly correctly. Um, but anyway, so, um, when they were saying like, oh, you know, you, you don't even need to explain about the situation with you and Sabal, we could tell it all already. What they, what they say is it's human, human nature is the same everywhere, right? Um, that's why they, they can perfectly well judge what was going on with Sabal, right? They might not understand Odonianism, but they know human nature, right? And so that, uh, um, that, question is one that which was really for me just kind of uh, going on in the background pretty the whole time I was thinking about all these things so uh, interesting that's come up so much already um, Noam says that Atro's point of view is an interesting mix of togetherness and separation it shows that the contrary concept can coexist absolutely Noam isn't it fascinating that Atro is the one who is on the one hand most inclusive right least on his dignity um, but also most elitist right, of all of them. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, let's keep going. This is, okay, so this is back on, um, back on Anaris. So that would make this chapter six, I believe. Um, I'm trying to keep the chapter straight, but it's hard. Um, I think so, I believe this is in chapter six. And this is when he, Shevik, is trying to, this is after his, the, the publication of his first thing under Sabal's name, right? Um, and he's trying to get the Physics Federation to allow more open discourse between Anaris and Urus. He brought this matter up with the Physics Federation, which Sabal seldom bothered to attend. Nobody there attached importance to the issue of free communication with the, with the ideological enemy. Some of them lectured Shevik for working in a field so arcane that there was, by his own admission, nobody else on his own world competent in it. But it's only new, he said, which got him nowhere. If it's new, share it with us, not with the Propertarians. I've tried to offer a course every quarter for a year now. You always say there isn't enough demand for it. Are you afraid of it because it's new? That won him no friends. He left them in anger. What do we see here? I, I, I feel in some ways one of the things I'm doing in this class um, is I'm kind of taking these passages which have some clear similarities and themes and ideas and the, the stuff that they're kind of working through and I'm just kind of sitting them down next to each other. But that's a very, you know, Le Guinian thing to do actually. So I'm, 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 I'm cool with that. Um, you see what we notice here. Um, Tom has a great question. Tom asks, does in anger refer to Shevik or them? He left them in anger. Like he was in anger when he left them or when he left them, they were in anger. Um, it's a it's a delicious piece of ambiguity, isn't it, Tom? Um, because uh, uh, presumably it was the case is both, right? 
I think that that certainly seems to be. Um, I don't think that that sentence is very interested in determining that question one way or the other, uh, but it's a great observation. Okay. Um, good. Noam points out that the concept of demand seems to have crept into Odonian society, um, you know, supply and demand, right? Um, and Noam, once you get to supply and demand, where are you? You're bargaining, right? Um, and Noam, I think you're absolutely right. And, and I think you're seeing what I was seeing in this passage, uh, which, is, um, which is this right here. Hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say, look at this. Right there. I'm gonna underline it. Right. <laughs> Woo -hoo! The irony of that word in this context, right? If it's new, share it with us, not with the proprietarians, right? Um, that's that's the problem. Um, that seems fine, right? Um, that seems, uh, um, you want to be faithful to, again, go back to that first conversation, that first argument between Shevik and Tiran. Think about Shevik's point of view in the argument between him and Tiran back in chapter two, right? When they were talking about, you know, learning more about Urus and he, Shevik, was so violently opposed to contact with Urus, right? Um, and now, or the idea that anybody might leave Uras, um, and um, they're propertarians. Don't don't share it with the propertarians. What defines? What's the difference between a propertarian and a non-propertarian? What's the difference? Where did it lie? Exactly, Tom, it's about sharing versus ownership. Exactly. If you own the thing, right, then you're a proprietarian. If you claim ownership over it, and that's exactly what they're doing, right? Um, share it with us, not with the pro. Don't share it with the proprietarians. That's proprietarian, right? This is not the first paradox of this kind that we have seen in these different NRSD passages, right? Um, so that's really interesting, right? We can see this, and this is another example of this kind of paradox that we see. But there's 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 more here even than that, right? And as Noam points out. What we see here, we see the whole us versus them concept, you know, in the mouths of the NRST here, right? Um, share it with us, not with them, right? We see the line uh, that they are drawing. And yet, Noam, that's exactly what makes the paradox so telling, right? On what basis are they? do they draw a line between them and us, right? What's the difference between them and us? according to the NRSD, when they're thinking about the Urasti, propertarianism, right? We share, they own. That's what separates us and them. And the very articulation of the us and them here, the very application of the term, uh, of the term propertarian is propertarian. Their, the strength of their assertion of the us versus them in fact, undermines the distinction between us and them in this passage, right? That's the paradox. That's the irony that Shevik is himself navigating, right? So, Karita, back to your question from before. Do they want solidarity? Well, no, they don't, right? They're not looking for it. They're not like, ah, oh, let us reach out to our Erasti brothers. In fact, they're hostile to it. But their very hostility shows that they are brothers to, to the Erasti, right? It shows that they already have a kind of solidarity. And that's kind of interesting, right? Um, and this thing about newness, right? And uh, I want to go back, Noam, to your other observation about supply and demand, right? 
Um, Some of them lectured Shevik for working in a field so arcane that there was, by his own admission, nobody else on his own world competent in it, but it's only new, he said, which got them nowhere. So, obscurity, right? The obscurity, the arcane, is there a noun? <clears throat> is there a noun version of arcane? A noun form of that word? Ar ar arcanity, arcane the uh you know the quality of being arcane Ar no arcana is are things that are arcane not the quality of of being arcane which is the, the abstract that noun is what i really want arcanity ar arcanitude if I if ever I don't have a uh, I mean as several of you already know from past experience if there is not an abstract noun form of an adjective and I find that I want one my favorite ending is the I T U D E ending everything is better with an itude at the end of it because it's the most comical and that is my uh, unbiased basis for this sort of thing um, but um, yeah yeah. Um, Yes, this is, uh, Tom is right, this is the same, um, the same accusation that was made against him at the beginning. Yes, yes, um, he's doing this, this new thing, this deviant thing, and we'll come back to this again as well. Um, but anytime you do a new thing that no one's done before, it's necessarily not going to be the thing that is in solidarity with everyone else right kind of by definition um but of course he has a good precedent for this right um in odo right the odonian principles themselves were new once right and her principles of solidarity were not in solidarity with her culture um are you afraid of it because it's new? He asks them, right? Um, and that won him no friends, right? But it's a very interesting observation. Keep that in mind as we uh, as we as we move forward. All right, it's been we went three whole slides without talking about the the metaphor of the wall, so gotta get back there. He this is in his conversation with the Dap. Uh, in uh, in chapter six, when he's admitted to being suicidal, right? When he feels like he can't go anywhere, accomplish anything. There's something wrong here. I don't know what it is. I do, said Bedab. The wall. You've come up against the wall. Shevik turned with a frightened look. The wall? In your case, the wall seems to be Sabal and his supporters in the science syndicates and the PDC. As for me, I've been in Abenai four decades, 40 days, long enough to see that in 40 years here, I'll accomplish nothing, nothing at all of what I want to do, the improvement of science instruction in the learning centers, unless things are changed or unless I join the enemies, enemies, the little men, Sabal's friends, the people in power. Explain to me the significance of that exchange about the wall at the beginning. I don't know what it is, says Shevik. I do. The wall. You've come up against the wall. Shevik turned with a frightened look. The wall? What, um, explain that to me. That's a really significant exchange, right? Tell me what just happened there. Why is he frightened? Why is Shevik frightened? <laughs> yes. Yes, Karita, good. Uh, Karita, I think it's exactly it. Karita says, you hear the voices too? Yes. It's like that. The, the, what, does the, what does the phrase mean to these two guys, right? To Badap and to, to Shevik at this point. We know what it means to Shevik, 
right? We've seen Shevik's recurring dream about the wall. Of course, we get introduced to the wall before that even, right? To the metaphor of the wall in chapter one. But the yes, James, the dream of the wall that he had as a child, right? Um, so that's what the wall means to him. He has not told Badap about his childhood dreams, the dreams that he's had since childhood about the wall, right? So Badap speaks confidently of the wall, that, you're, that you've come up against the wall. This is, of course, exactly true. Shevik has come up against the wall, his wall, the wall that he's always dreamed about. Um, how, but how can Badap possibly know that, right? That's what frightens him. And he doesn't. Clearly, he doesn't, right? The casualness with which Badap talks about this, he's not being like, oh, yeah, I know you, uh, all about your recurring dream, right? I've, like, psychically divined it or, or you know, whatever. Um, no, he's just using a metaphor. Right, um, but uh, but Shevik is um, here's something else. Right, he thinks about this in this different sense. Um, yeah, yeah, um, and yes, Yana, it certainly does foreshadow the wall that he crosses in chapter one. Absolutely, or rather, I would say it the other way around, uh, uh, Yana. Given the structure of the story, right that the wall that we get in chapter one um, is sort of serves as the serves as the metaphor serves as the symbol as the the well and anyway in, in any case is connected to the wall that we learn about in chapter two from his childhood dreams that was a wall a wall between Shevik and other people a wall between Shevik and the goal that he was trying to achieve he feels like he's been up against the wall um in trying to fulfill his purpose right of being a physicist um it seems like a wall between him and other people remember he and Takfair were kind of like separated by the wall or reaching through the wall to each other so it's about separation kind of like the separation between us and them because that, right, was what we were looking at last class in the isolation stuff. The ultimate fear, right? You've got the us versus them stuff that we've been talking about. The ultimate fear is that us versus them at the end of the day is just me against everybody, right? That us versus them, you know, you can you can say like, oh, you know, we humans versus those damned aliens, right? Those are big categories and might seem kind of comfortable. It includes, right, Atro's us versus them includes the human solidarity that that Shevik is working for, right? So, um, so that all seems very good, but of course, down deep, there's still this fear that us versus them is like the port of Anaris sur surrounded by the wall, right? That us versus them means me and everybody, me against everybody else, that each one of us is our own us and them is everybody. Um, and then ultimately we're all alone. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, the DAP here, however, is defining the wall. He's saying the problem is the wall that he's come up against is Sobel and his supporters. That is the people in power. There's still an us versus them question here, right? Where is Badap drawing the line between us and them? Um, with Badap, it seems to be us Odonians, right? Us true Odonians versus those who have at best slipped away from the true principles of Odonianism, right? And the things that he says are shocking, right? And Shevik does not want to hear them still at this stage when they meet. And this is chapter six, isn't it? Chapter six, I believe, um, when, uh, when the two of them are meeting. Um, yeah, yeah, Neil, it's like the, the government and the non-government is seem, does seem to be pretty much the line, the distinction, um, the is the, the discrimination that Badap is doing, right? Um, unless things are changed, right? What does that mean? How would things change? Um, things would change through revolution, right? That's the Odonian way, right? Adon Adonianism is always about 
revolution. Um, revolution, in a sense, one way of understanding revolution is tearing down the wall between us and them, right? Um, that works. I think that works, right? I think about it in terms of revolutions that we know of, right? The American Revolution, right? Those who have uh, taxation with representation and those who have taxation without it, right? Let's tear down that wall. Um, what's what's we, we want you to, to, to treat us either as equal citizens with everybody else or to treat us as a foreign country, right? Think about the French Revolution and the cultural thing there, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Revolution is breaking down the wall between us and them. Um, but of course, does that just mean making them like us? Is that the goal of revolution? In which case, that's kind of uncomfortable, right? Um, he can't be right, can he? But that? Uh, we've already seen that he's kind of onto something here, right? Here's more of his assessment. No, we have no government, no laws, all right. But as far as I can see, ideas never were controlled by laws and governments, even on Urus. If they had been, how would Odo have worked out hers? How would Odonianism have become a world movement? The archists tried to stamp it out by force and failed. You can't crush ideas by suppressing them. You can only crush them by ignoring them, by refusing to think, refusing to change. And that's precisely what our society is doing. Sabol uses you where he can. And where he can't, he prevents you from publishing, from teaching, even from working, right? In other words, he has power over you. Where does he get it from? Not from vested authority, there isn't any. Not from intellectual excellence, he hasn't any. He gets it from the innate cowardice of the average human mind, human nature, right? Public opinion. That's the power structure he's part of and knows how to use. The unadmitted, inadmissible government that rules the Odonian society by stifling the individual mind. Shevik leaned his hands on the windowsill, looking through the dim reflections on the pane into the darkness outside. He said at last, crazy talk. Yeah, Karita says, but that does tend to be uncomfortably right about things. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, his assessment of Sabo here seems spot on, right? Um, where does he get his power? Not from vested authority, not from intellectual excellence. Um, <clears throat> there could be an artificial societal structure that elevates one person over another like um, Atro's world, right? Atro, who believes in birth and aristocracy, um, that the quality of one's ancestors determines one's worth, right? <clears throat> that would be vested authority. That would be, you know, this societal structure which imposes power, giving it to some and keeping it from others, right? Nah, that's not how things work. Not in. Anaris, anyway, according to Badap, right? Not from intellectual excellence. That is to say, so it's not a question of those who have the greatest ability. So like some kind of meritocracy where those who, in fact, have the most talent gain power and authority, right? It's not like that either. Because, again, Sabo can do. So what is it? The innate cowardice of the average human mind human nature right human nature is to go along with things right public opinion that's the power structure he's part of and knows how to use um yeah noam says the collective is now another source of oppression yeah noam we begin to see just as we were seeing the the paradox of the application of the word proprietarian, right? 
as a definition of who they are and who we are. So we can also see the paradox of the word solidarity, right? Um, when solidarity becomes a club, and we saw that, right? In that earlier passage where the, the physics, the physics um, syndicate, right? Where they were not open to Shevik's new ideas, right? Um, it suggests there's something wrong about him. That he's the only one who can do this. He's the only. He's not in solidarity with everybody else because he's being different, right? He's doing a new thing. But if he is going to be compelled to drop this thing that he's doing, then they're not in solidarity with him, right? Um, and yes, Brian, you are right that even in a meritocracy, the ability to decide who has merit conveys power. Yes, yes, it does. It does. Um, Rachel says, are we to understand the, that Odonianism is contrary to human nature? And this is where people like Sabo can get control. A great question, uh, Rachel. And I don't think so. I don't think that the, the, it's funny, Rachel, you know, it's really easy to read through this book. Um, if you read through it, especially if you read, read through it relatively quickly, it's easy to come away from it thinking like, this book is just absolutely in love with uh, with uh, communism, right? It's just absolutely in love with the idea of you know like the the whole Odonian ideal and and uh, you know isn't communism awesome and isn't capitalism horrible? It would be really easy to come away from this book with that impression, right? Um, but Rachel, as you're suggesting here, we can go through it again, right? And when we go through it the second time it now kind of looks like actually the book is suggesting exactly the contrary, right? Um, that Odonianism is contrary to human nature. Rachel, I think you could make an argument for that position. I think you could easily build an argument from the book to support the idea that Le Guin is arguing that Odonianism, nice though it is in many ways, is contrary to human nature. Humans are not wired that way. Even those that are raised in this society, I mean, you cannot find two you know, more thoroughly convinced Odonians than Badap and Shevik, right? Maybe even add Tiran and Takbear in there as well, right? They're, they're, they're all good Odonians, Odonians born and raised, right? Um, if, you know, everything that, um, you know, everything that nurture can do, you know, the culture in which they're nurtured can do uh, in order to, to make them by nature into Odonians has been done. Badap considers himself the perfect Odonian. Um, and yet, um, uh, and yet we see there seems to be something in all of them, really, which is struggling against that, right? Which is not, which is not comfortable with it, right? Um, but I agree with you, Nancy. I don't think the Erasti system is really human nature either. And what's more, I think we can see just as many inconsistencies there as in, in Inaris. If we look at the Inaris passages carefully, we can see ways in which the Odonian system is breaking down. If we look at the Erasti system, I think we can see ways in which the Erasti system is breaking down as well. Um, neither one of them uh, is really true to human nature. It's almost like in order to be true to human nature, we have to embrace both in a kind of human Setian solidarity, right? Maybe even beyond Setian, right? That being Atro's term. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe. Um, yeah, Tom says uh, she could be arguing that human nature will undermine any system, um, but isn't some system necessary anyway to keep human life from being the war of every man against every man? Right, because Tom, that anxiety is, I think, very much there, right? This question of, again, is is the us versus them really just me and everyone else and everyone is in that same position, right? I think it, it's a legitimate question that this book asks. Um, and, uh, or rather, maybe, as I was saying, a fear that it confronts. Um, I think that's, it's, that's a really, that's a really great, question um yeah yeah um 
no, no, I'm not going to talk about left hand darkness, though I acknowledge your connection there. Uh, but yeah, yeah, no, we're, we're not reading that book now. Uh, maybe someday, but not yet. Um, all right, let's keep going. Okay. This is still in that same argument with Badap, right? And Badap is trying to explain because, you know, Shevik is still resistant to Badap's claims about the true status of NRST society, the true nature of NRST society. Um, it's not the individuals posted to PDC, Chev. Most of them are like us, all too much like us, well-meaning, naive. And it's not just the PDC. It's anywhere on Anaris. Learning centers, institutes, mines, mills, fisheries, canneries, agricultural development and research stations, factories, one product communities, anywhere that function demands expertise and a stable institution. But that stability gives scope to the, uh, to the authoritarian impulse. In the early years of the settlement, we were aware of that, on the lookout for it. People discriminated very carefully between administering things and governing people. Is that word discriminated again, which seems important. They did it so well that we forgot that the will to dominance is as central in human beings as the impulse to mutual aid is and has to be trained in each individual, in each new generation. Nobody's born an Odonian any more than he's born civilized. But we've forgotten that. We don't educate for freedom. Education, the most important activity of the social organism, has become rigid, moralistic, authoritarian. Kids learn to parrot Odo's words as if they were laws, the, the ultimate blasphemy. Shevik hesitated. He had experienced too much of the kind of teaching Badap was talking about as a child, and even here at the Institute, to be able to deny Badap's accusation. Excellent, excellent. Um, Nancy says there are two mentions of authoritarianism in this passage. Yes, we have the stability, right? Uh, anywhere that function demands expertise and a stable institution, that stability gives scope to the author author authoritarian impulse. So that's part of human nature. Bidap says, right? The, 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 the part of human nature is the authoritarian impulse, right? And so what happens? The whole civilization, the whole culture, the whole NRST culture becomes increasingly rigid, moralistic, and authoritarian, right? They have no laws on Anaris. They have no religion on Anaris, right? Um, they have no government on Anaris. And we see all of these things growing, right, in a sense. The reverence for Odo is almost religious, not only in its sort of scope, but in its quality, right? She is revered. Her teachings are to be followed, but they're to be followed from an authoritarian perspective. Um, Rachel was just asking, could it be argued that Odonianism is a religion? You could argue that. Increasingly, I think you can argue that. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and remember the effect of the narrative of the story, right? Shevik hesitated. He had experienced too much of the kind of teaching Badap was talking about as a child and even here at the Institute. And we've seen both, right? We remember his, his, what the speaking and listening group that he got kicked out of, right? We remember the hypocrisy of his nurse in, in the nursery, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, we've seen that. We've seen it. <laughs> Mine hypocrisy, says Arthur. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah, so it's 
human nature. It's human nature that must be guarded against. The price of solidarity is constant vigilance, Noam says. And uh, that does, I, I would accept that, Noam, as a paraphrase of what the DAP is arguing here, right? Um, you've got to be, um, uh, we have forgotten, right? They were on the lookout for these, for the growth of this authoritarian impulse earlier on, but not so anymore, right? We've grown less vigilant. Um, this comes back to the question, does this mean that Odonianism is unnatural, right? Is contrary to human nature. If you've got to be on constant guard against sliding back into these other patterns, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, Yana is remembering about how forcefully they have to stamp out egoizing in children, right? Um, yeah, exactly. Um, mind, mind son is natural, right? That's nature speaking. Yeah. Um, that's a really good question, Karita. Karita asks, do they have parrots? Right? Uh, Badap uses the uses the 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 verb to parrot Odo's words, right? Um, she's wondering what's the what's the what's the Pravic word for for parrot? Great question, because clearly they don't have parrots. Um, I guess they would say that word was brought in by the settlers, right? Um, so it's a Pravic word, which is used because it, it's a word that exists in Pravic because the concept was imported from Urus, right? Just as the words damn and hell are in the Pravic language, but they don't really know what the word hell means, right? Because um, the concept is not part of their culture, but the word is there. And, and again, remember in that conversation, that linguistic conversation they were having, they're asking about it, like, why, why, why do we even have a word for that in Pravic? Um, and the answer is the settlers still had the concept, right? Um, yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, I don't know if that's something that Le Guin was talking about there, but uh, that is a, a thing that she's intending. But Karita, it's a really sharp observation. Badap, if Badap in his in the very indictment that he's making against Odonian society, right, against his society, how they have left the principles of Odonianism, if in making that accusation he is using a word which is imported from, which is ultimately an Arasti word, right? An Arasti concept. Um, that's a really interesting piece of uh, piece of irony there as well, right? And Tom Hillen says, so if parrots did not exist, it would have been necessary to invent them. <laughs> yeah, ex exactly. Exactly, Tom. All right, back to Tyrion. Um, looking at what happened to Tyrion. I don't really know what happened down there. He wrote to me several, this is Badap still, of course. He wrote to me several times, and each time he'd been reposted, always to physical labor in little outpost communities. He wrote that he was quitting, he, that he was quitting his posting and coming back to North Setting to see me. He didn't come. He stopped writing. I traced him through the Abenai labor files, finally. They sent me a copy of his card, and the last entry was just therapy. Segvina Island. Therapy. Did Tyrion murder somebody? Did he rape somebody? What do you get sent to the asylum for besides that? You don't get sent to the asylum at all. You request posting to it. Don't feed me that crap, Bidap said with sudden rage. He never asked to be sent there. They drove him crazy and then sent him there. It's Tyrion I'm talking about. Tyrion, do you remember him? I knew him before you did. What do you think the asylum is? A prison? It's a refuge. If there are murderers and chronic work quitters there, it's because they ask to go there, where they're not under pressure and safe from retribution. But who are these people you keep talking about? They. They drove him crazy and so on. Are you trying to say that the whole social system is evil? That in fact they 
Tyrion's persecutors, your enemies, they are us, the social organism? Side note. Just as an illustration of how awesomely interwoven this book is and how impossible it is to separate one thread from another, you'll notice how these passages, these first eight passages that we've looked at, have been uh, um, just like beautifully tied together by this us versus them theme, right? It's one of the things we keep coming back to. And, and, and this seems to be, this passage would, would appear to be a culmination of that theme, right? I'll confess something to you. These eight passages are from the slides I had prepared for last week's class. And when I prepared them for last week's class, I was only thinking in terms of isolation and the society and its relationship with the society. I wasn't even thinking in terms of us versus them. That vocabulary is something that's emerged from the earlier part of our conversation here this evening. And once we've noticed it, now it's everywhere, right? Uh, and we keep coming upon it again and again, and it's fitting together perfectly, spoiler, with the passages that I wanted to already to talk about in chapters uh, uh, in chapters seven and eight that uh, that I read for today. Um, and I didn't that, that, that particular connection among them wasn't even one that I was thinking of. Um, but there it is, all tied together. Um, this book has a way both of making me feel dumb and of making me look smarter than I am putting these things together. Um, anyway, yeah, okay. Um, Carita, Tyrion's bad end makes me very sad too. Um, Arthur is voicing, I believe, skepticism about the victims asking for punishment. Um, but it's not punishment, Arthur. See, thinking about it in that term is thinking about it entirely. There are no prisons, right? Remember, the prison concept is not a thing in Anaris. We don't even, we teenage boys growing up on Anaris don't even know what a prison is. We don't understand the idea, right? We have to, like, experiment with it. We have to, we have to, we have to do some play acting to even kind of wrap our imaginations around the idea of prison. Um, it's so alien to us as NRSD boys that when we set it up and we decide to do the experiment, we're all fighting over who gets the privilege of being a prisoner because that would be cool, right? Um, so it's not a prison. It's a, it's a, it's a refuge. Um, when he talks about it in the uh, context of talking about like uh, right? Those who move on and on and who are getting like persecuted, like for good reason, justly persecuted by their peers, except who decides when the persecution is just and when it's unjust, right? Again, we think back to Shevik identifying himself as a Nuknib, right? And this whole question, which of course this issue with Tyrion is raising for the first time is who decides, right? If the community decides they don't want to put up with this person, that they find him objectionable for some reason, does that make the society right and him wrong? Because the us is one and the them is big, right? Um, Nancy points out, of course, we don't get to see the asylum from the inside, right? And Nancy wonders what the asylum is really like. Um, a, uh, a question to be asked, right? We don't know. We don't know. Um, Noam asks, why would someone need refuge from a perfect society? Well, they would need refuge from the retribution of their peers for their own antisocial actions, right? Because antisocial actions are the issue, right? Rape, murder, 
and chronic work quitting are the three things that are talked about as as leading you to the asylum eventually. But again, you don't set you. No one sits in judgment over you. No one compels you. It's not a prison, right? No one puts up a wall around you and forces you inside it. But when you build a wall around yourself, when you wall yourself off from the rest of society, right? Then that the asylum is the only place where you can go. Because when you wall yourself away from the rest of society, when you are so um, when you are so blinded, to, so 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 deaf to, so oblivious to, so disregarding of everybody else, right? You've cut yourself off from everybody else so completely that you're willing to kill people, to rape people, not to contribute. Uh, you know, work quitting that that paralleling the side by side, you know, Karita, as you say, between um, uh, chronic work quitting and murder. Steam does seem a little startling at first, but you can see what they have in common, right? I am disassociating myself from, I am, I am cutting myself off from solidarity, right? I'm, I refuse to live in solidarity with my fellow people. That's ultimately what those three things have in common, what, what, what murderers, rapists, and, and chronic work quitters have in common, right? I am not going to respect or care about the lives, the wills, the choices, the benefit, the good of my brothers and sisters, right? I'm not going to do it. Therefore, you, you need a place for those people. Rather, those people then need a place to go because the society won't have them, right? And people are going to beat them up, kill them. And Shevik is quite blunt about that. Um, Yeah, Karita, you're right that, that asylum is an interesting world. People think of it, uh, you know, as she says, people think of it as horror film fodder now, but it used to mean a, a safe haven. Yeah, yeah. To seek asylum, we still will use that word sometimes, right? Um, if you're seeking asylum, it means you're seeking refuge, right? Safety, protection. And that's the sense in which the asylum works. That's the sense in which the word works. But Karita, you're right. Um, we have there another piece of dramatic irony, right? The word asylum in some cases and in some ways of looking at it, there's a fine line between a prison and an asylum, right? If an asylum is where you take somebody who doesn't fit and shut them up, right, by force, in order to keep them under control, that's like a prison, right? You're thinking about it the same way as you think of a prison. But Karita, as you say, it's not what the word asylum means. And it's almost as if the NRSD, like the NRSD people are just totally unaware of that other sense of the word asylum, right? They're only using it in the seeking refuge sense, right? Um, But Dap refuses to accept the idea that Tyrion requested posting to the asylum. Um, it's Tyrion I'm talking about. Tyrion, do you remember him? Um, Tom Hillman says, maybe Tyrion requested posting there in the same way that Shevik requested that Sabal add his name to his work. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. Um, Tyrion, in many ways, is a foil for Shevik himself, right? Tyrion, Shevik is going to come to not fit into his society. He is going to be, Shevik is going to identify himself as a nuknib, right, as we talked about last time. And as a nuknib, you just keep moving on, except he moves on further than most other nuknibi move, right? But Tyrion was there first. And Badap suspects that, or no, 
Badap suggests that Tiran's case proves the deep hypocrisy of NRSD society. There is government. There is a they out there within society. There is a they who act, right? Um, there is a they who is not us. We, the society is not based on real solidarity. There is power. There is an authoritarian structure. Sabo is proof of it. What happened to Tiran is proof of it. And of course, it sets up what's going to happen to Shevik. Um, yeah. Yeah. This is in his conversation with Bedap's friend, Salas, the, the um, composer who composes music that nobody likes. But how can they justify this kind of censorship? You write music. Music is a cooperative art, organic by definition, social. It may be the noblest form of social behavior we're capable of. It's certainly one of the noblest jobs an individual can undertake. And by its nature, by the nature of any art, it's a sharing. The artist shares. It's the essence of his act. No matter what your syntax say, how can DivLab justify not giving you a posting in your own field? They don't want to share it, Salah says gleefully. It scares them. Vidap spoke more gravely. They can justify it because music isn't useful. Canal digging is important, you know. Music's mere decoration. The circle has come right back around to the most vile kind of profiteering utilitarianism. The complexity, the vitality, the freedom of invention and initiative that was the center of the Odonian ideal. We've thrown it all away. We've gone right back to barbarism. If it's new, run away from it. If you can't eat it, throw it away. Remember, it's this conversation which prompts Shevik to say what Badap calls the first cynical thing he's ever said, right? Uh, which is when he asks him, uh, uh, remember, what's the title of the piece of music that Solace wrote that he tells Shevik about, which was rejected? Do, do, do you remember the title of the piece? He titled it The Principles of Simultaneity. Didn't he? The Principles of Simultaneity or The Joys of Simultaneity. Uh, and then Shevik says, maybe they'd be less scared if you called it like the joys of solidarity or something like that. And the DAP congratulates him. Um, you just said a cynical thing. Um, Tomas Delgado asks, one wonders how an, Odon an Odonian society would have evolved in a planet richer in resources. That, of course, is the counter argument to what the DAP has just articulated here, right? The freedom of invention and initiative that was the center of the Odonian ideal, we've thrown it all away, gone back to barbarism. If it's new, run away from it. If you can't eat it, throw it away. Of course, we will soon see if you can't eat it, then starve, right? Um, the society has not yet fallen into the famine, which is going to be such a crisis for them for a long time. Um, you know, this is a multi-season famine, a multi-year famine that they will be in which is going to have a major impact on their society. Um, the gap doesn't allow for that, right? Um, yeah, and Tomas is suggesting, of course, if their planet were richer in resources, perhaps their attitude towards non-utilitarian stuff would have been different, right? Maybe, maybe. Um, but you know, Tomas, you can make the other argument as well, right? You could say, because they're on a planet with few resources, solidarity has thrived because they needed solidarity to survive. Nobody's a propertarian on Anaris because everything on Anaris is crap. Nobody wants it, right? They don't fight over a hole in bread because hole in bread isn't any good. Um, so because they don't have the recent resources that people want, um, it's easier to share everything in common, right? So I mean, you can turn that argument around the other direction, right? 
Um, and that seems to be one of the things that um, that uh, Shevik is contemplating when he's on Urus, right? Um, and seeing all the things that they have and all the stuff that they own and the stuff that they lay claim to, um, it's uh, it's different. Yeah, Nancy was just saying was just saying the same thing um, because it's difficult to su survive. They have to cooperate exactly. Um, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Hey, Noam, we're totally at the famine. Noam is chiding me for discussing the famine when we're not there yet. We're totally there yet. Uh, it's in chapter eight, which is totally in today's reading. Just because we haven't done any passages from chapter seven and eight yet doesn't mean that that's not today's reading, because it totally is. In fact, boom. All right, this is, make sure this is right now that I've said boom. Um, yes, I have. Here's uh, Sabo. What worked against you was a combination. This is Sabo explaining why he's fired, except you can't be fired because that would mean you have a job, which means that inc includes the word, the verb have, right? Uh, uh, and fired suggests somebody else has power over you, which is also not Odonian. But anyway, what worked against you was a combination of things. The abstruse, irrelevant nature of the research you've done these last several years plus a certain feeling, not necessarily justified, but existing among many student and teaching members of the Institute, that both your teaching and your behavior reflect a certain disaffection, a degree of privatism, of non-altruism. This was spoken of in meeting. I spoke for you, of course, but I'm only one syndic among many. Since when was altruism an Odonian virtue? Shevik said. Well, never mind. I see what you mean. That was, by the way, I think that's, I think I, I messed that up. That's Shevik who's saying, well, never mind. I see what you mean. Um, yes. Yes. Nancy Fosberg quickly points out, this is exactly what happened in the speaking and listening circle. Exactly, Nancy. You see the precise parallel here. Not only is it the same situation, where the speaking and listening circle refuses to let him speak or to listen to him, right? Um, and so the the uh, the disaffection, right? The uh, um, their rejection of him is completely unodonian, but being justified in odonian language, in overtly hypocritical odonian language, right? But of course. Nancy, it's not only that we see that parallel, it's the same thing, right? What was the thing he got kicked out of the speaking and, and listening circle for? Talking about challenging sequencing, right? With the rock hitting the tree, right? It was the first time he thought of that. First time he thought of this sort of theoretical, philosophical difficulty with sequencing theory. Um, and it came to him, and of course the, the the teacher didn't believe that it came, or the facilitator, whatever he's called, um, didn't believe that he thought of it himself, right? Um, but he thought of it himself, um, and nobody else was interested, right? Nobody else, uh, nobody else uh, uh, wanted to hear about it. So too now they're running away from a new thing, and it's uh, it means he's not sharing, right? This is not sharing, sharing. It's egoizing, and that's exactly what Sabo is saying to him again. So yeah, Nancy, you're absolutely right. Um, and I agree, Noam. I am also interested in the difference between solidarity and altruism. Yes, those two things are very interesting. Um, of course, we see Sabo makes a gaffe here. He makes a mistake. Um, accusing Shevik of non-altruism, right? A certain disaffection, a degree of privatism, of non-altruism. And Shevik calls him on it. Since when was altruism an Odonian virtue? It's not an Odonian virtue. We learned that way back in chapter two, again, in that debate that Tiran and Shevik were having, they talked about this. Altruism suggests power. 
to be altruistic to somebody else is to assert power over them. It's non, it's not Odonian. So what is the significance of that? By messing that up, Sabo is betraying the fact that he does not understand Odonian principles at all. He's just, well, Karita, he's just parroting, parroting it, right? Um, and not even doing so accurately. Yeah, yeah. Um, Sarah Lagarde says she was interested in, in the passage a couple paragraphs down. There was a mighty desire in him to tell Sabu finally to go to hell, but it was a different and profounder impulse that found words. Actually, he said, you're probably right. With that, he nodded to Sabu and left. And Sarah Lagarde is asking, is Shevik jumping the wall there? Thanks, Sarah, for helping me get two passages in for the price of one. Um, uh, He resists so many things we say about this, Sarah, as always. Um, human nature seems to rise up in him and lead him to want to finally tell Sabal to go to hell, right? Um, but he doesn't do that. What he does is he makes the choice for what? Solidarity instead? Um, actually, you're probably right. He said, um, it's so complicated. I'm not sure exactly how to gloss that, Sarah. On the one hand, we could say, we could ask the question, what exactly does he mean when he says that? Like, when he says, you're probably right, what exactly is he, is he talking about, right? probably right that I shouldn't stay here. But this outcome is a right outcome. Um, I shouldn't be at the Institute. And in this way, of course, it's a fulfillment of the all the discomfort of, you know, he's been uncomfortable with being at the Institute. Like, remember the double desserts, right? And the single room and all that stuff. I mean, he's had this sense from the beginning that there's something unodonian about the Institute from day one, right? So is that what he means? Like, you're probably right. I am disaffected. Yeah, I don't fit in here. Um, and so he means it as a kind of a backhanded slap or doesn't care whether Sabo understands that it is one, right? Um, uh, yeah. Um, is he just, Sarah, as you ask, being politic, right? Um, yeah, just kind of, you know, still holding back from saying that thing that he wants to, you know, telling Sable to go to hell, right? Um, is he... Um, accepting that he shouldn't be teaching? Remember, he himself had been doubting that. Maybe they're right. Maybe what he's doing, maybe his physics is not correct. That's why he was considering suicide at one point, right before he met Badap again. Maybe he is egoizing in doing his physics. Maybe, maybe the the general temporal theory is just egoizing. Him fooling himself and separate and and acting not in solidarity with everybody else. Could he be having those doubts, that doubt here? Possibly. That seems to me conceivable. No, Karita, I don't recall any other reference in the book. Remind me, anybody remind me if I'm forgetting it, to suicide. Karita's asked about the general feeling towards suicide. We know about rape and murder, um, but we don't know about suicide. I don't recall any other reference to suicide. I mean, like it's just the cultural percep perception of it. Um, is it looked down upon? I mean, is it considered shameful? Is it, a, 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 you know, an un Odonian? Um, uh, 
I, well, I don't think we have any references to it. Um, the way that Shevik brings it up suggests that it's shameful, I think, maybe. Um, I mean, it's not like an open option, you know. Have you thought about suicide, right? I mean, I'm sorry, you know, so I, I, naturally I thought about suicide, but then I figured maybe not. I mean, obviously that's not the tone in which he's talking there. So it doesn't seem like it's a normal thing, like a, an accepted thing, an accepted option. Um, but again, we have no, we have very little clear sort of positive uh, um, issues about that. Uh, Neil, yeah, I'm going to be getting there, though maybe not tonight. Um, I want to talk for a minute about Benub. I love Benub's name. Of course, all the all the Pravik computer generated names are kind of funny, uh, but Benub is my favorite. Of course, Benub is delightfully palindromic as well, which is which is awesome. Um, and yes, Karita, it's a really ugly name. Um, there is a kind of, um, of course, thinking about um, Tolkien and phonetic symbolism, thinking about Dimitri Fimi's seminar uh, uh, yesterday. Benub's name does seem to really fit her. There does seem to be meaning there, I think. Uh, but anyway, she had a mind both insidious and invidious, which could find the bad in anything and take it straight to her bosom. The factory where she worked was a poisonous mass of incompetence, favoritism, and sabotage. Meetings of her syndicate were bedlams of unrighteous innuendo, all directed at her. The entire social organism was dedicated to the persecution of Benub, right? This, this is the, the articulation of the Benubian point of view, right? Um, <laughs> Nancy Fosberg says, I feel like I know this lady. Uh, just as Sarah Lagarde was saying, don't we all know people like that? Um, uh, and Tom Hillman is wondering, uh, is there righteous innuendo? I think there can be righteous innuendo, Tom. I would defend that point. Um, but uh, what's the problem with Benup? I mean, she's annoying, right? Remember, Talkfair thinks she's hilarious. Talkfair just laughs at her when she talks this way, which she doesn't seem to mind. Um, but, uh, what is it, uh, um, why does he dislike her so much? Karita, I think you've absolutely got it here. Shevik dislikes Badab because she makes him think about all the things she, he dislikes about himself. She's an unflattering mirror. She has this, unkind, like, she, this description of her here shows her in her most negative possible light right and emphasizes the ridiculousness of her point of view right um the entire social organism was dedicated to the persecution of benub right um and i just the way that i i love uh, uh Le Guin's tone here um uh how she is the way that she states these things how the critique of the nubs idea is completely implicit in uh, in the description of her point of view, right? Um, you know, the extremity of the language here, which is obviously echoing the nubs own expressions, right? A poisonous mass of incompetence, favoritism, and sabotage. Um, uh, uh, <laughs> Yeah, uh, that's a that's a, a poisonous mass of incompetence, favoritism, and sabotage. It doesn't quite roll off the tongue like a, like a wretched hive of scum and villainy does. Um, uh, I think, by the way, that that's uh, uh, something I, my uh, my eight year old son is prone to quote at times. Um, I remember when we were in West Virginia over the summer and we were driving past a casino and he was asking what that was. And we told him it was a casino and we explained what went on there. And he pauses and says, and says, uh, would you call it a wretched hive of scum and villainy? And we were like, yeah, I think that's pretty safe. <laughs> anyway, um, uh <laughs> yeah, so it doesn't quite roll off the tongue quite like that, but nevertheless, it's pretty close. It's it's uh, it's it it's pretty good. But yeah, exactly, Karita. He sees in her, he hears in her. She keeps coming back and saying, while she's being absurd and annoying and paranoid and 
and and ridiculous, she's nevertheless saying the things that he's also thinking, right? As happens immediately after this passage, which is, you know, which comes in when he has just returned and found Takvir gone. She's been reposted away, right? Um, and she, Banub, immediately starts accusing DivLab, the division, uh, you know, the, the distribution of labor office. Um, she immediately starts accusing DivLab of deliberately trying to break up partnerships, right? They're opposed to partnerships and they're trying to break them up. They did this on purpose, right? Now that's absurd, right? But then she starts saying things like, and we're supposed to be a free, we're, we're supposed to be free. What a joke, right? Mm, gosh, right? That's, that strikes home, right? Because of course in this, and this, and he's going to go right from here to confronting Sabal, or rather being confronted by Sabal's hypocritic, hypocritical, anodonian um, uh, uh, accusation of, you know, non-odonianism, right? Um, and she's like Badap in apparently being correct. Now, not entirely correct. I mean, that's the thing. It's not just like, oh, Benub, she's really got her finger on the pulse of the society, right? She's not. Got her finger. She's, a, she's, a, she's this crazy, paranoid, annoying old woman, but she, well, not that old, I guess, uh, older than they, anyway. Um, but uh, anyway, yeah, it's, um, uh, Um, yeah, yeah. You can't distance yourself from it. He can't distance herself from it. And the idea that she, so Badap is, you know, Tiran is one foil for, for Shevik. Badap is another foil for Shevik. And there's Benub. So you think about, think about Shevik, right? And this sort of constellation of people his relationship with his society and his attitude towards his society. Um, and um, um, the, um, the fact that his own, the perspective that he is gaining, right? The point of view which is developing gets mirrored in one way, in, but like it's, this one is a really uncomfortable, is the most uncomfortable mirror of all. Right, because the question is just, am I, am I like that? Am I benub over here? Right. There seems like a kind of a wry recognition of that possibility when he's calling himself a nuknib last time. Right. Um. Is he just a nuknib? Is he an urus just because he's moved further along than most nuknibi do? Right. That he is shirking. Um. That he is uh, refusing a work posting, and so become a nuknib rejected by the society? Um, is he like Benub? The entire social organism was dedicated, dedicated to the persecution of Benub. In other words, so there's Benub and she's surrounded by a wall and the rest of the society is on the outside. Um, but haven't we seen the society building a wall around Shevik and trying to keep him in like a prison? right? Um, separating him. What you do is not okay, right? You are, you're not being in solidarity. You are, here. we are us and you are them, right? But of course, what's the difference? Whether you're, you know, as, as you know, he was saying this, Shevik was saying this about prisons from the very beginning, right? Um, locking, locking the door, you know, locking in and locking out, same act, right? Um, is it likewise the same act when the society builds a wall around you or when you build a wall between yourself and the rest of society, right? Um, at the end of the day, what's the difference between Tiran and Benub, right? Tiran being the, the sort of the ultimate one that society built a wall around, right? And shut him in. Whether he's been actually sent off by force and imprisoned at the asylum or not, nevertheless, he's been imprisoned, right? He's had a wall built around him. Benub has built a wall around herself, right? A wall of paranoia and <clears throat> ill temper, of proprietarianism, right? The way that she covets their room, 
right? Um, one of her big complaints is that they nabbed the corner room that she really wanted for herself. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Hmm. Uh, let's leave it there. I'll come back. We'll start with Sabal next time. Um, next time, I put off today. There's a fundamental irony in saying, I'm going to postpone discussing time, <laughs> right? Time sequencing. Uh, so from a simultaneity perspective, I've already been talking about the time issue and the, the nature of time and sequency and simultaneity. Um, but I will get to that next time. Um, so uh, um, anyway, well, I, <clears throat> the conversation, go make sure you reread the conversation that um, Shevik is having at the party um, with the one who really wants to know and the proprietarian who thinks he knows it all, the rich man who thinks he knows it all. Um, I'm going to, let's, let's do that. Um, go back and reread that. Um, the scene as Shevik, you know, their, their discussion of, of uh, chronosophistry as, uh, as uh, Shevik gets increasingly drunk. And yes, then Nancy, the sexual assault on there. Uh, immediately thereafter. Um, we'll talk about Vea as well next time. Vea, you'll remember, turns out to be the woman in the table, right? We'll talk about the woman in the table too. Uh, I, I figured you know, since we talked about that passage earlier on from chapter one, the the eroticism of the of the of the of the of the, you know, the erotic cabinet making uh, of Uros that he perceives in the spaceship uh, when he perceives the woman that he believes to be the woman who was in the table in the first place, we should totally um, we should totally get back to that. So we'll do that. And if I'm very lucky, we'll then also get to the note in his pocket and his connection with the uh, uh, the rebels and revolutionaries and his actual meeting with the unpropertied classes of Uros. And his finding, his finding of brothers, and his discovering discovery of true solidarity in us, and we'll have a look at that as well. All right, thanks everybody. Thanks for joining me. Um, another wonderful. Dis thanks so much for your observations, and I will see you guys next week. Um, uh, yeah. Yes. Don't forget the webathon. Mark your calendars. Webathon on the 29th of October. Um, we'll have uh, lots to talk about then too. So thanks everybody. Bye now. Good night.